The following is a presentation of Seaside Community Baptist Church. So the two kinds of people that exist the believers and the unbelievers in this world the believers believers who put their faith in Jesus Christ the believers who who believe uh, through faith they are saved because of the grace that God showed and there are another kind of people who are scared because they're unbelievers they don't put their faith and they're judged according to the law of God and they're condemned because of their sin sin and the Bible talks about eternal damnation and judgment of God so but we as believers do we need to have the fear of God in our lives do we really need to have the fear of the Lord in our lives let's see what the Bible says in Hebrew Hebrews chapter 12 20, uh, 28 and 29 this is what the Bible says therefore since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire reverence and awe are mandatory for every believer in Jesus Christ this is the kind of fear that God expects in our lives the fear that we can tremble in his presence Bible says in James the devil knows that he is God and he shivers the devil knows that he is God and he shivers and we as believers we know that he is God but we don't shiver so is our faith subordinate to that of the devil is our are we the people who are not in awe and not in reverence because of who God is this is something we need to question ourselves I'm not telling us to be scared of God because Bible says this perfect love casts away all fear if we truly experience the true love of God you will not be afraid because he's your father you'll approach him in absolute assurance and confidence and Bible says in Romans 8 nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus so that's not the fear that we're talking in the worldly terms but the fear of God that Bible talks about is respecting him obeying him submitting to his discipline and worshiping worshiping him in his awe awesomeness is something that we really don't understand it's one of those words that has been degraded a lot say when a guy looks good man you look awesome you know they use that so glibly the word awesome is only limited to God and his glory after all when we see at this creation the magnificence of these mountains and these cliffs we are in awe of just this creation imagine the awe that you'll have in your hearts when you see the creator himself and that creator this almighty God wants relationship with you and me but we take it for granted the first time I was flying in an aeroplane I was looking through the window 35,000 feet going at 600 miles per hour and I was looking at these tiny little houses over Turkey over Romania Ireland all the way here so when I was looking at all those things a song came to my mind the song that came to my mind is he knows my name he knows my every thought and all of a sudden I realized these are tiny little things there and in that there's a tiny little creature that is me and he knows my name and he wants intimacy with me that itself was an awesome moment the true awesome moment of knowing my God a man of God said we have defanged the tiger of truth we have tamed the lion the tragedy of modern faith is we are no longer capable of being terrified the tragedy of modern faith is we are no longer capable of being terrified Jeremiah chapter 5 21 to 22 this is what my Bible says this is what God says hear this you foolish and senseless people by the way this is God talking he said 
Hear this, you foolish and senseless people who have eyes but do not see, who have ears but do not hear. Should you not fear me, declares the Lord? Should you not tremble in my presence? I have made the sand a boundary for the sea, an everlasting barrier it cannot cross. The waves may roll, but they cannot prevail. They may roar, but they cannot cross it. So this series, through this Fear of God series, I want to explore whether we have any symptoms in our own lives where, which exhibit a lack of fear of the God that we serve. So today, we'll start off by looking at a couple of people in the, in the, in the, in the book of Acts and try to explore what God teaches us through that. So, New Testament times, you know, Christ died and he rose again, outpouring of the Holy Spirit, mighty revival time is happening. And the Bible says in Acts chapter 2, 42 to 47, they devoted themselves, these are the new Christians and believers, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions, their goods. They gave to anyone uh, as he had, had, had needed. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together gladly and sincere hearts and praising God and enjoying the favor of all people. And the Bible says the Lord added to their number daily those who are being saved. We need to understand a little bit about this New Testament church. When these believers got saved, they began to live in communities. They began to dwell together and assemble at the temple courts for fellowship, for prayer, for breaking of bread. Everything that they had was, in co was common to them. They found strength among one another. They found the strength despite the threats of the Roman government, despite the probationary orders, they still continued to assemble because God has changed their lives and they wanted to become the disciples of Christ. So what are the factors that led them to, the, to, the, to live this uh, communal, communal lifestyle? What made them come together and live together like that? See, the answer is pretty simple. Most of the disciples were, of Christ were from Galilee. And when they left and became followers of Christ, they moved all the way to Jerusalem. They had nothing that they owned because all that they owned was in Galilee. So in order to sustain this assembly or the church, the kohal, the Hebrew word, in order to sustain the assembly, they began to sell their belongings back in Galilee and they began to sell, sell what all they owned because they saw the bigger picture of what God is doing among their community. In order to do the upkeep, they sold their possessions. In order to establish God's sovereignty and God's continuing grace among the people, they were there for one another. History records about a certain Yosef Barnai Levi. This man apparently relocated from Cyprus where he sold his field. He put the money at the apostles' feet and this is one of the examples. This is what they did. They found the greatest treasure in Christ Jesus and everything else seemed vanity and they began to just get rid of, get rid of the things that they, that they're causing that, 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 that was tying them down. And they just came and lived together as a community. During those days, the rabbis had some specific teachings and they had some econom uh, economy models, economic models that they followed according to the teachers of the sages in the, in the Judaism context. There are four levels of how people lived. There are some people who said, what is mine is mine, what is yours is yours. The teachers, the rabbis said they're neither good or bad. And there are other kind they, that said, what is mine is yours and what is yours is mine. And the rabbis call them ignorant people. Doesn't make sense, right? What's mine is yours, what's yours is mine. And there was a third kind of people who says, what, what is mine is yours, what's yours is yours. And there were a fourth kind of people who said, what is mine is mine, what's yours is mine. Sometimes I act like that. What's mine is mine, what's yours is also mine. And Bible says, or they believed, the sages believed, these are the kind of wicked people that God abhors. So who are the people that God was expecting to be a part of the kingdom? The third kind who said, 
What is mine is yours. What's yours is yours. So these were the models they were looking to in order to live in this community as they sold their possessions and they were living together. Things were going great, new church, new revival, new church acts, powerful time, and one dramatic incident has happened in the book of Acts, my friends, that shook the church. Let me show you what it, what it is all about. It is a story of a husband and wife called Ananias and Sapphira. And let's see what happened with them. Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back a part of the money for himself. And he bought the rest and he put it at apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some money you have received from the land? Did it, didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied to men, but to God. Then it continues and it says, when Ananias heard this, he fell down and he died. A great fear seized all who heard what happened. And then the young man came forward, wrapped his body and carried him out and he buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, tell me, is this price you, uh, you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said, that is the price. Peter said to her, how could you agree to test the spirit of God? Look, the, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out also. At that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. The young man came in, and finding her dead, carried out her and, bur and buried her beside her husband. A great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. Ananias and Sapphira are two classic examples of hypocrisy and presumption that exists in the church today. They faked their spirituality to impress others, but it had disastrous consequences. Remember the times that this happened. It was a time of a, was a, time of a tremendous outpouring of the Holy Spirit. It was a time of a great revival. Yet in the midst of revival, even among congregations at that time, they had hypocrites. And the price they had to pay was their dear life. So let's delve a little deeper and try to understand this story. Now a man named Ananias together with his wife Sapphira also sold a piece of property. Also sold, that means there's somebody else who also did it. They were selling their possessions as I talked about the communal living before. So they were selling the things and they sold some things and the wife's full knowledge kept back a part of the money for himself and he bought the rest and put it at apostles' feet. Great times. Everything was going great. They sold a piece of property. My friends, selling the piece of property was not a problem. To keep the money that you made from selling the property, according to the Bible, is not a problem. It's your money. But what went wrong, however, is perhaps they have promised to God, perhaps they made a covenant publicly, that when we sell this whole property, we'll give all the money that we make from that land and give it to the Lord. Probably they made a public announcement and a display. The outward sin was lying to God himself. But the inward sin was much deeper. It's a sin of hypocrisy. Perhaps they thought, Ananias and Sapphira, who cares? Revival time, there's a whole noise, everybody's giving something. Oh, why don't we chip in and just make an announcement? Who cares? Who's going to count the money anyway? Who knows how much we made for the money? Nobody cares whether we keep a part of it back. They made this decision, and they, with their full knowledge, husband and wife, they kept the money, a part of the money back. What happens? Then Peter said, and nice. How is it that Satan filled your heart that you lied to the Holy Spirit and kept for yourself some money that you received from the land? First of all, how did Peter know how much they made? How did Peter know how much they actually gave? 
Only simple answer to that is the revelation from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit revealed to them because the Bible says God discerns the motives of our heart. He's not based his judgment on our outward actions. He based his decisions on our inward motives. Ananias and Sapphira may be outwardly great in donations and whatever, but the motives are what God is concerned with. And the Holy Spirit revealed to, Holy Spirit revealed to Peter about Ananias and how he put the money back to himself. My friends, this kind of wisdom, this kind of sneakiness that exists in our lives is demonic wisdom, Bible calls it. It's worldly wisdom, Bible calls it. This is what it says in James. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show it by his good life and deeds done in humility that comes from wisdom. But if, it's, but, but if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in our hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. For such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, and is of the devil. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. But what is the wisdom from God look like? Bible says this, but the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace loving, then considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace shall harvest in righteousness. Satanically inspired wisdom for Ananias and Sapphira. That's exactly what they did. They thought they could get away with their worldly wisdom, but God doesn't expect such actions. God does not condone such actions. So this morning, in our workplaces, in our churches, are we doing something based on the worldly wisdom or by the divine wisdom that comes from God and God alone? Do you think that nobody's watching? My friend, God is watching. Anything we do, God is watching. And the Peter continues to say, didn't it belong to you? He's talking about the money. Before it was sold, or the property, after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such thing? You have not lied to men, but to God. You have not lied to men, but to God. The outward reflection of the inward corruption, lying to God himself. When we do something in the church to hurt each other's feeling, remember, it's not the other person's feeling that you're hurting. You're hurting the feelings of God. Church is God's. You don't hurt the pastor. You don't hurt anybody. But if you play, I'll use this word, if you play fool with God, be careful and watch out. When we go around planting seeds of contention, when somebody goes around and plants seeds of contention, you're not playing with Seaside Community Baptist Church, but you're playing with the sovereign God whom the church belongs to. I'm scared for you. I'm really scared for you. Outward reflection of an inward corruption. Mind you, such things are not happening yet at Seaside, okay? It's just that we need to be prepared for this. Bible says simply, let your yes be yes and no be no. Anything beyond this comes from an evil one. When we do anything, always put God as a focus. This is God's church. When we do anything, how does he respond? It's very important for us to know. What happens after that? When Ananias heard this, he fell down and he died. A great fear seized all who heard what happened. Fear. Of course, it is fearful and frightening situation. An immediate judgment of God happened. Jeremiah 48.10. This is one of my most scary verses, I should say. Most fearful verses in the Bible. Cursed is he who does the work, work of the Lord deceitfully. Cursed is he who does the work of the Lord deceitfully. Is there, are there people involved in ministry in different churches who do the work half-heartedly? Bible says, cursed is he who does the work of the Lord deceitfully. Be careful, my friends. Consequences were obvious. God doesn't want half-hearted people doing ministry. Then what happens? Then young men came forward, wrapped his body, and carried, carried him out, and he buried him. 
according to the law in Deuteronomy 21. When a guy dies based on the judgment of God, he's not unbombed, he's just buried right away on the very same day. So these young people come back, come up, they wrap his body and quickly take him and bury him. And I was asking the Lord, why young people? Lord, why young people? This is what the Bible says. 1 John 2, 4. I have written you, to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you. You have overcome the evil one. Then I asked the Lord, Lord, really? Does the word of God abide in them? Did they really overcome the evil one? Just need some clarification on this, Lord. You know what happened? The young people, God revealed this, the young people may not have the experience in life but once they know the truth, they'll stand for it. They're ready to act upon it. They're ready to face the world with the little truth that they know. So my friend, if you're young and sitting here, listen to this. Do you have the word of God abiding in you? Are you strong enough to face your situations in school? And are you ready to pick up the dead bodies of the lies that you're hearing and ready to bury them immediately? Are, ready, are you ready to act in faith knowing that your God is sovereign? You are a passionate young man that is sitting here. To what extent are you living your life for the Lord? Are you strong enough to overcome the evil one? If not, my friend, listen to the Lord. Learn from the scripture. Hide the word in your heart and you will not sin against him. And you will be meant to cause great and tremendous things happening in this Christian community and in this world. You will not hesitate to pick up the bodies of lies, of hypocrisy, and bury it immediately. Be encouraged, young man. Be encouraged, young girl, because God wants you. You are God's special property. What happens after that? You're all with me so far? Pretty intense sermon, eh? But it's okay. It's all good. About three hours later, his wife came in. Probably she attended the women's cooking classes at Superstore. Done that, three hours later she came. Not knowing what has happened. Of course, there's no emails, no text messaging. Peter asked her, tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said, that's the price. You know what? They communicated very well. That was a good marriage. Isn't that awesome how they communicate? We keep this, okay, we keep this. This is the agreement three hours later, whatever. They have no idea, but they, yeah, that's what it is. That's what my husband did. She was ready to give that answer. Good communication, good understanding, but for wrong reasons and wrong motives. Then Peter says to her, how could you agree and test the spirit of the, look, of the Lord? Look, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door. They will carry you out also. At that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. The young man came in and finding her dead, carried her out, buried her beside her husband. What was Sapphira's sin? Presumption. Presumption of God's forbearance. Yeah, whatever, the Lord is... We'll do whatever, it's fine. He'll take care of that. It's not a big deal. What happens? Divine chastening. She died immediately as well, and they took the body and buried her. I'm going to go out on a limb and I'm going to say a few things which might hurt both the husbands and wives, but this is very important. Wives, you don't have to compromise with your husband when he's living a sinful lifestyle. If, you, if your husband is watching some things on TV that he's not supposed to, make sure you stand up and not try to justify. If you are with your husband like Sapphira for wrong reasons, you will pay the price. And husbands, if you see that your wife is not obeying the scriptures and the word of God and she wants to do her own thing, caught up in materialism and all that, don't try to fuel that flame. Stand up with the truth. It's not that you want to go down con condemning her, but it's important that both of you are on the same page. I see a lot of compromise in families. I see so much compromise, compromise is astonishing. You watch some of the things on TV, it's like, okay, my husband likes it, I'll watch it. I got to make him happy. 
You don't have to make him happy by allowing him to sin. Wives, you need to stand up. But don't take it to another extreme and point out everything that he does as wrong, all right? The main thing is, when sin happens, there is no need for wives to just compromise and bear with what husband does. You don't have to live according to the scripture. God will honor it. And we saw this little Liam will be watching Danny and Maggie as he grows up. And your children are watching you. Every decision that you make, everything that you say, everything that you do is watched by them very closely. Wives, be strong. Honor the Lord. Confront your husband when he's doing something which is abominable in God's sight. God will honor it. He is the one who's going to restore the families. Don't take, take it as a negative thing. It is for his good that you need to take a stand. Husbands, take a stand. And your wife is going away in all the stuff that she doesn't need to. Husbands and wives, we need to stand firm together. Do not be unequally yoked, even after marriage. Ananias and Sapphira, they were yoked very well for the wrong reasons. And young people, teenagers, or whoever is trying to get married, don't compromise with your walk with the Lord. Don't go for something cheap because God has something better for you. Don't look for a girl who's just cute. That's not the factor that determines the rest of your life. When you're old and ugly and you're dying on the deathbed, is she going to stay with you? That's the one you need. The Bible says, do not walk, do not sit, do not talk. What are your influences in our life? What are the things that are dragging you along? My friends, one day, these influences are the ones who will be buried, and next to that, you will be buried as well. Ananias, Sapphira, buried for wrong reasons. We need to be aware of such people, such things that influence our lives. What happens after that? Great fear sees the whole church and all who heard these events. Great fear sees the whole church and who heard all the events. All of a sudden, God became alive now. So my friends, hypocrisy and presumption is an indication that we don't have the fear of God in our lives. If you are living hypocritic Christian lives, it's an indication that we don't have the fear of God. If you are presuming that God is going to bear my sin or wink his high when I mess up, that's presumption, and that indicates we don't have the fear of God in our lives. And let me tell you one more startling thing. This happened in the New Testament church. This is not an Old Testament phenomena. I remember a time in India, there was this Hindu convert who came to have crusades in my city. A Hindu convert who became a Christian. And while he was preaching and sharing from the religious books how he found Christ and he was a priest, a former Hindu priest who became a Christian, he found Jesus Christ in the true light. A crusade of 2,000, 3,000 people were sitting there. There was one young man who drove in with his bike in open air crusade. He came to the right of the front of the stage and he uttered profanities, uttered this and that against the God, against Christ, against everything. Everybody were watching intently. What is going on? Here's the preacher preaching. This guy is uttering all these things. He disrupted the gospel message that night. You know what happened? As soon as he left the meeting, the next thing we hear that he was on the road, we hear a crash and a bang. He was killed in an accident immediately. That's the God we serve. That is the God we serve. He is alive today. He is alive today. How long can we get away with what we are doing is something we need to question ourselves. You might be thinking that we are doing some great ministry. Probably we put Christ on the cross and made him a helpless man. It's like, yeah. But remember, he's not on the cross anymore, not in that empty tomb anymore. He's seated on the right hand of the Father. We cannot take things for granted. We cannot give an offering and say, okay, church, here, see how much I can give. Don't display hypocrisy because you're bringing judgment upon yourself. Don't try to show how generous you are with wrong motives. 
wrong motives being the key. You want to be generous to display to the congregation, watch out, God is watching you carefully. You want to do ministry for the sake of pleasing others, watch out, God is watching your motives. Do I want to preach a sermon with high vocabulary, expressing my intellectualism to please seaside community? I need to watch out that God is watching me. Are we teaching study groups? Are we doing things, saying we're doing things for the Lord, pretending to be humble? False humility, God is watching. We might presume that we can continue in the way we are living our life because we haven't experienced the Lord's chastening. We haven't experienced the Lord's discipline or correction yet. That is dangerous. Bible says, Numbers 32, 23, but if you fail to do this, you will be sinning against the Lord, and you may be sure that your sin will find you out. It's only a matter of time. It's like burying things in the sand. When the wind blows, it'll be made obvious. It's a matter of time. James 1, 14 and 15 says this, but each one is tempted when his, by his own evil desire and is dragged away and enticed. Then after his desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and when sin is fully grown, it gives birth to death. So what happens right after this incident with Ananias and Sapphira? Look at this. The apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders among the people and all the believers who meet, to, meet together in Solomon's colonnade. There's some mighty signs and wonders that have continued to happen right after this incident. And the believers continued to meet in this particular location called the Solomon's Porch in some other translations. What is this Solomon's Porch? So if you look at the gospel, this is where Christ actually claimed that he's the light of the world. And this is what he's, the Bible says. It was a feast of dedication in Jerusalem. It was winter. Jesus walked into the temple, into this Solomon's Porch, this particular area where these believers are meeting, okay? This was previous to his uh, death. So this is where Christ walked in. Then the Jews surrounded him and said to him, how long do you keep us in doubt? If you're Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered and said to them, I told you and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But you do not believe because you're not of my sheep. And as I, as I said to you, my sheep will hear my voice and know, that I, I know them and they will follow me. And I give them eternal life and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given me is greater than all. No one is able to snatch them out of my hand, of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. And verse 31, listen to this. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. There is only one response for the gospel. You either receive him or pick up the stones to stone him. We cannot be neither hot nor cold sitting in a congregation. You are either afraid of the eternal damnation or you have the reverence of God's awesomeness. We cannot have something in between. Gospel evokes a response, my friends. Christ evokes a response, and this is where the believers were gathering, and probably this is the same location where Ananias and Sapphira died as well. What happens after that? Church, listen to this. This is very interesting. No one else dared to join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. Church, they were if I was the guy, I would be doing whatever it takes to increase the numbers of the church. That's what is happening today. We compromise the gospel so that more people can come in. Bible says no one else dared to join. Why? Because they saw the fear of God. Are we ready as Seaside Community Baptist Church if nobody else dared to join the church because they saw the awesome reverence of the fear of God? I'm ready. Rather than know who God is for actually who he is, than have a small um, mean, menial idea of who God is and come to church and be a part of one. No one else dared to join the church even though they were highly regarded by the people. The people still respected the believers. Oh, you're a Christian? Good for you. But I'll stay away because I've seen what happened to Ananias and Sapphira. But see what happens next. 
Nevertheless, that's that being the key word. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. Interesting. So who are these people who actually joined the church later on? These are the people who had the complete picture of who God is. These are the people who saw the holiness of God. These are the people who saw the fear of God. They also saw the love that was displayed through Christ Jesus who was crucified on the cross. And then they made the decision to be a part of the church. There's a quote or a proverb that says, half knowledge is dangerous. I think that's true. They had the complete picture, only then they became a part of the bride because they knew it would cost to be the follower of Christ. Do we know, church, what is the cost of following Jesus Christ? To deny ourselves, take up the cross and follow him? Do we know what it will cost to us eventually? Would it cost my life? Would it cost my property, my business? Would it cost things that I love so dearly? Have you ever counted those things? Sometimes it takes all of those things to, be, to learn obedience and to love and to know God more. Are we prepared for that kind of walk? Acts 15, 16. As a result, people brought sick into the streets. You see, you see a different phenomena here. The sick were in the streets. They laid down uh, on the beds and the mats so that they, at least Peter's shadow might fall uh, uh, on some of them as they passed by. The crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those tormented by the evil spirit. And all of them were healed. All of them were healed. Bible says, Christ said, when a disciple is fully trained, he will be like his master. These disciples were fully trained and they were exhibiting the works of Christ. If it was me, I like these good parts in the Bible. I want to keep Ananias and Sapphira a little, at a little distance. I like that sick in the streets, mats. You know, when I became a new Christian, believe it or not, I tried to do that. I said, Lord, I prayed enough. Let me walk in the streets and see whether the sick people on the streets will be healed or not. Nothing happened. I was really disappointed with God. So why do I have less faith or what's going on with me? I, because I had nobody to teach me or anything. For two years, I, I was by myself. I learned something like good bits like this. I want to do it. And I look at the pictures in Sudan, Christian, and I say, oh, why not I walk there and all these sick people get up? You don't have to have extra clinical staff, right? That would be awesome. Wouldn't we like these good parts? But the only way things can happen in our lives, if we have the complete picture of who God is, we have the fear of God in our lives, we can also see the grace of God in our lives. That's the simple formula. We need to have a complete picture in order to, in order to understand who God is, and then only things will move. Let me sum it all up as we conclude. There is God. And all we hear nowadays is love, love, love. God is love. He loves you. You go get drunk. He loves you. You do whatever you want. He loves you. But remember the two sides of the same coin. God is also holy. Holy means the primary meaning of the world. Word holy means he's separate. What does that mean? God is holy, is separate from sin. And when sin tries to approach God, it'll burn, it'll die because he's a consuming fire. He doesn't need to do stuff. His very nature can cause calamity. When somebody jumps off a building, it is not, it's, it's the gravity that breaks that individual. It's not the falling part that is bad. The stopping part is pretty bad. It's what he hits is what causes a disaster in our life. We can keep sinning. We can keep falling and keep going our way. The flight seems extraordinary and intense adrenaline rush. I'll do whatever it wants. I'll keep sinning. It's okay. God is still with me, loves me. But remember, a pavement is coming. Our God is there at the end. His holiness, and when our sin and his holiness meets, there is disaster. That happened in the New Testament. You see both these elements constantly ref reflected through this whole passage. First, we see this New Testament church that experienced the love of God to the fullest. Revival, people getting saved, going wonderful, and all of a sudden, Ananias and Sapphira happens. 
the holiness of God displayed. And after that, what happens? Signs and wonders are happening, Bible says. And what happens after that? People are afraid to join the church, the holiness of God. And what happens after that? The church still keeps growing. Miracles still continue to happen. Church, it's time to have a fuller picture of who God is. We cannot pick and choose who we want God to be. We cannot modify him as a grandpa sitting in the clouds with his toes sticking out. We cannot, he cannot dance to our tunes. His nature is love and his nature is holiness as well. It's time for us as a congregation to receive the fear of God in our lives, to keep away the hypocrisy and presumption that is in our lives. It's time to repent of this sin in our lives because God is watching. Jeremiah 5.22, should you not fear me, declares the Lord, should you not tremble in my presence. May these words ring true in our lives. Even as I was preparing this, I realized that today is a newcomer's luncheon for the people who want to join the church. You know, so what a sermon to preach on this particular day. But at least you have heard what is the cost of being a part of the church. Hopefully, this will either keep you away or it will really give you a decision to make, give you the strength to make a decision to be a part of this church.